Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 25th of August. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined again today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, Australian Government Legislates Powers for Banking Crisis Management and the 20th Anniversary of Princess Diana's Murder to Protect the Monarchy. So first, Australian Government Legislates Powers for Banking Crisis Management. Um, Craig, the opening line of our weekly Australian Alert Service this week is, it's like 2007 all over again, but this time we know what's going to happen. And it really is. There's predicate after predicate after predicate that's emerging every day, every week, relating to the financial system in Australia and around the world, which really, you know, having lived through 2007-8, it's just so eerily similar. And you know that everything's building for a big final break here, a big final crack in the financial system. I'll just rip through some of them that have just, you know, since our last show, basically. Um, this week, a 140-year-old British company called Provident, which is a subprime lender, specialised in small loans to low-income people, but it's been doing it for 140 years, right? Mm. Um, it just tanked on the stock market completely after it announced a shock loss. And, you know, there's, there's a bit of shenanigans to try and blame it on technical difficulties, etc. The bigger issue here, I can assure you, is that um, the actual economy in which people exist is getting worse and worse and worse every day. So these, the kind of people who took these loans because they desperately needed money, right, and were able to somehow scrounge, to scrounge money to keep them paid back, they're fine, they're, it's, it's getting more and more impossible to do that, mm. right? And so you're getting a, a sign like this that, oh, a big, a big established financial institution is going under. Robbie, you know? I found it very interesting because we did uh, republish an article in our alert service this week um, from Pam Martins and Russ Martins, which was, you know, from the yeah. talking about the Wall Street crash of 2008. What I found staggering was that the actual uh, inquiry into the 2008 crash actually proved that the crash didn't start in 2008, but in spring of 2007. So up there, that would have been about March or so yeah, yeah. of 2007. The crash didn't take place in 2008, and it didn't start with Lehman Brothers. That's right. There was all these other pointers, including you know, HSBC, one of the world's biggest banks, is the first sign of it, yep. making these announcements of these huge losses in their subprime mortgage area. So what we're talking about now could be seen as the precursor mm. for the exact same process that took place in 2008. And I found that absolutely fascinating. No, that's what you're saying. These are precursors. We, we can, you know, if you've got to be willfully stupid to have lived through 2007 and see these predicates now and not recognise them as precursors, mm. right? That's their precursors to something big. Because all the other predicates in the financial system are worse than 2008. Like global debt's worse, global derivatives are worse. You know, this is getting, this is getting which, serious. Which is also, Robbie, why it's so important that people really move on our Glass-Steagall campaign. You know, what is Glass-Steagall? It's a move to separate out the normal boring banking deposits, loans and so forth from all the highly speculative stuff, investment banking, merchant banking. We need that separation now. We need to protect our, uh, our genuine banking system and it needs to be done before the system comes down, That's right. not afterwards. Well, Craig, so we have, there's a few things that have happened just in, in, in the, um, the last week also on that question. As we've been pushing here for quite a few weeks now, we've got a proposal that we prepared for Parliament, mm -hmm. proposal for a Glass-Steagall separation of Australia's banks. And what we've been doing is asking people um, to participate in our campaign to get that around everywhere, right? Take that to your member of Parliament, call, call, either get an email version from us, a PDF, or a hard copy, call in for a hard copy, and get it to your member of Parliament. Robbie, right? one thing, I just come from a meeting from an MP in my, in, 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 you know, recently, and this morning actually, and what you find is that they're all interested in this subject, any MP that's in Parliament now knows there's a problem with the financial system. And I think that program on Four Corners last Sunday yes. night really has spurred off a lot of discussion. And if I'm an MP, if I'm a local member of Parliament and I've got a constituency of 150,000 people, I think I'd be very concerned if I, that, that, I, that I would be wanting the well, solutions. And they better be because the government this last Friday, which, so just after we shot our last program, Craig, our previous program, the, the government issued a press release announcing that they have draft legislation to give APRA, the bank regulator, crisis management powers 
for a banking crisis. Now, the legislation is called Financial Sector Legislation Amendment, brackets, Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Bill 2017. Now, what this bill does, we've looked at the explanatory memorandum, it's basically giving um, APRA broad powers to be able to do virtually anything in a crisis. Now, um, some viewers would be familiar with the term bail-in. We've been warning about this since 2013. Bail-in is where um, the authorities take over a bank and to keep it going, a bank that's got into trouble, to keep it going, it, it takes money from the bank's even the bank's customers, like its depositors, in an extreme case, and that happened in Cyprus in 2013, but otherwise in the bank's more unsuspecting investors, like mum and dad who might have been convinced to buy bank bonds, for instance. They can find that those bonds have been bailed in so that the bank no longer owes them to those people, owes money back to those people, and the bank can pretend its debt lower, is lower than it otherwise is, right, and then it's fine. So this is a nasty power. Now, in Australia, we haven't got this legislated yet. It's in the place in the European Union. It's in place in the UK. Um, it's a, there's a variation of in place. Well, I think it's because of our places. campaign going back to 2013. Robbie, oh, absolutely. Isn't. We spooked them. Because back then in 2013, we got wind of legislation, quote unquote, in train for bail-in. Now, it hasn't taken that form. The form it's taken in Australia is what, what we call bail-inable bonds, um, which are sold on the stock market which are sold at higher interest rates than normal and they, 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 convert in they will be converted in a heartbeat if there's a problem with the banking Well, what's system. happened, that, so that those, the banks have been selling those bonds, but so far the government has not legislated a bail-in um, structure for Australia. What they're doing in this bill is giving APRA the power so that if and when bail-in does get legislated, APRA already has the powers to implement it, right? So these are like enabling powers for APRA. But there's a, there's, a, a, um, there's a disconnect here, Craig. There's something that's, that's, that's obviously wrong. They're preparing for a crisis. They're preparing to manage a crisis. But they're not saying there's a crisis. Well, I, that's right. They're not saying it's a crisis because so they wouldn't say that. But this, tell, this tells you they know a crisis is coming. But isn't, wouldn't it be better instead of preparing to manage a crisis, do something to stop the crisis happening in the first place? Well, that's what Glass-Steagall's for, Robbie. So. That's the point, right? Glass-Steagall stops the... You know, it, it puts a structure in place so that it, if speculators do make losses, those losses will be contained to themselves and not affect the whole system. At the moment, they've got a system that if speculators make losses, it can bring down the whole system, hold everyone's um, deposits to ransom, and the government has to bail them out. Put in place a system to stop the crisis in the first place. So, therefore, if politicians who are dealing with this bill, Craig, have this right in front of them, and as you know, they're, they're starting to pay attention to what's going on. We need to have an attitude as, as the Australian public, there's time to stop pussyfooting around. We've got to demand they do something far more sensible. Glass-Steagall is the far better, more sensible alternative here. So if you haven't, there's two things that we need the viewers to do, and we need you to sign up to do them now. Right? Don't just watch this show and go, oh yeah, I hope someone else does it. No, no, there's thousands of people watch this show every week. If you're an Australian, you act as soon as you get off this. We'll put the instructions on the bottom of the screen, etc. So if you haven't yet taken the proposal to a Member of Parliament or emailed it to them or mailed it to them, you make sure you do that. Find out who your Member of Parliament is and send it. But the other thing we want you to do now is the Treasury is open for submissions on this crisis management bill. And so we want as many Australians as possible to make a submission, just one sentence, you make it up, but it's just basically say, crisis management is stupid when there's a, much, there's a way to stop a crisis, to avert a crisis, it's called Glass-Steagall. Go with that instead. That's all you have to say. If you want to say more, go ahead. You're an Australian mm. citizen, feel free to say more. Now, there's an email that you, can, um, that you send it to, which is aptly called crisismanagement at treasury.gov.au. So we'll put it up on the screen. Um, we'll put it on the YouTube page, etc. Send an email with, to that effect now. Get off this program and send it now. In 2014, Craig, we generated something like 700 submissions to the financial system inquiry on Glass-Steagall. And that had a real impact. And some of those right? submissions, Robbie, weren't very long at all. No, they the, weren't. The shorter, Short actually, the better. Yeah. Not everybody can do it. Don't feel ill-equipped to do this, right? It's the volume that's the key here bombard these people because otherwise they are playing footsie criminally fraudulently with private banks to work out a scam that's going to rip us all off when a crash happens that they know is happening but they're not talking about publicly so if you're watching this act on it
With that said, Craig, we'll take a break and move on to the next subject. Welcome back to the CEC Report. 20th anniversary of Princess Diana's murder to protect the monarchy. Um, Craig, the anniversary, who'd have thought it? Mm, <laughs> 20 years. 20 years. Um, it's, it's the 31st of August. She, she died in the early hours of the, Diana, Princess Diana died in the early hours of 31st of August, 1997. So it's the 20th anniversary. In commemoration of this event, the CEC has produced this pamphlet. Who killed Diana and why? And I urge you to call in and get yourself a copy. Um, you can order a copy from us, right? Um, they'll tell you what you have to do when, when, they, when you call in uh, how to get one. Let me say a few things and then I've got some videos to play just to put this in context. But why are we, why are we commemorating this? No royal is more special than any other human being. None. The monarchy is an institution, is an abomination, frankly, in the 21st century. Forget it. The idea that some can be born into power, we should have grown out of by now. It's an old idea, Robbie. It's, it's an old a, idea. It's called oligarchism. Yeah. We use that term a lot, sometimes loosely on this show. But oligarchism basically means the rule of the few over the many. Over the many. And it gets much worse than that. If you look at things like empires in the past, which are oligarchies, they have a king and they treat their... Uh, people as subjects or well, the, human yeah, cattle. And, and those peoples exist to serve that, that power. And that right? still happens today. Well, it does. I mean, we talk about the British Empire and people say, oh, yeah, the British Empire died out ages ago. No, we talk about the British Commonwealth all the time. And you're talking about an informal financial empire located in the boardrooms of the large banks that run a financial system instead of the gunboats and you know, red coats that used to happen in the old British Empire, same thing, same control factors, same loss of freedoms, same dominance of industry, but just a different mechanism today. It's called globalisation. Same, same way of dealing with troublemakers as we're going to talk about. Um, so as I said, no royal is more special than any other human being, but Craig, it has to be said, some royals are more special than other royals. And if you've watched the documentaries that have been on in, in as we've been approaching this anniversary, Princess Diana does shine through. Her personality does shine through. She was a beacon of humanity in what is otherwise a soulless and frankly pretty evil institution. Um, now, just to elaborate on the point you just made, the monarchy is, the British monarchy, the British crown, with this royal family in it, is the central power in the undemocratic power structure that sits above the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States by extension, even though the United States has sort of been drawn into it. Um, through the monarchy, the monarchy connects the City of London and through the City of London, Wall Street, and they, their financial power alone is greater than most governments can take on, right? Mm. And that's, you see the way someone like, uh, an institution like Goldman Sachs can have so much influence. It, the monarchy connects the British and Commonwealth intelligence agencies. That's to plug into the monarchy, right? They answer directly to the Crown. And through them, you have this Five Eyes apparatus that we talk about here, and that the, the American intelligence agencies are brought into it. And Donald Trump is seeing how much power they have above his elected power, right? Mm. They can just they they see themselves as a power to themselves. That comes from these. The, the, they're actually actually their British origins. The deep state operations. That's the deep state, yeah. right? Mm. It's the military. It also connects the military apparatus of all these countries and the arms industry, and that's a key one. And its power actually depends on the public assuming it has none. And there's an Australian legal expert, who's one of the top ones in the world, Anne Toomey. She calls it not the constitutional monarchy, but the <laughs> chameleon monarchy. It just blends in the background, no one notices it, but it exercises real power. It exercises unofficial power all the time. Lots of things are done just to please the, 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 the crown that otherwise wouldn't be done for anybody else. It exercises official power when it has to, and the sacking of Whitlam in 1975 for trying to gain national control of our resources was an exa example of that. The British and American intelligence agencies had overthrown a series of governments like, I'll give you one, Mossadegh in um, Iran in 1953 who tried to nationalise Iran's oil supplies. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to let their own one of their own in Australia, Whitlam, take control of resources off them, right? Um, so... This royal family that is in there now reflects that institution. 
And there's some there's aspects about it that are really unsavoury, right? Look, they supported Hitler. This royal family supported Hitler. Um, they protected pedophiles. If you know anything about the Jimmy, Jimmy Savile scandal, he got he was untouchable for 40 years because of his friendship with this royal family, and he was one of the most monstrous pedophiles to ever live. Um, and all this gets covered up by a compliant media. So into this family marries Diana, and she fulfills her duty, which was to produce an heir and a spare, as they called it. And after that, she rebels against the fakeness and the coldness of this system. Right? She, as, she, as she started seeing more and more, she, this, is, this is wrong. Then she became a threat, Craig. She had an in, her insight into the um, monarchy itself, her animosity to the arms trade, which they're heavily involved in, um, and her influence over the future king made her a threat to the very existence of this monarchy. And I want to play a quick clip now, which is a, in a recent doco broadcast by National Geographic called Diana in Her Own Words. And these were secret tapes she made to a friend of Andrew Morton's mm -hmm. who, who produced this book about her in 1991. It was really explosive. These are from the tapes. And she's asked, does she, she reveals in there that she's already acting on her intention to alter the monarchy. So just have a quick look at that. History fascinated me, but I never anticipated I'd end up in the system, History. in the books. <laughs> Would you leave I am altering it for him, but in a subtle way. People aren't aware of it, but I am. Through William learning what I do, and his father to a certain extent, he has got an insight of what's coming his way. He's not hidden upstairs for governors. Do not bow down to pressure, you know, not let all this chat disturb me. It took me six years to get comfortable in this skin. And now I'm ready to go forward. So you see there, Craig, that kind of intention where she says, I'm already altering it. You know, if you're, the, if you're the crown and the apparatus around the crown, you're going, hang on, you're not altering us, baby, right? Mm -hmm. And anyway, so we'll follow this. We'll take a quick break now and follow it up afterwards. So, Craig, as we, just, as we said before the break, we're discussing 20th anniversary of Princess Diana's murder to protect the monarchy. Now... The pamphlet that I talked about that we just produced, it's actually a tribute to a pretty great guy who I got to meet um, before he died. His name's John Morgan. He was an Australian Kiwi um, forensic accountant. It's, an, it's quite an extraordinary story. He was diagnosed with a terminal disease called mu uh, multiple system atrophy, which basically meant his whole system was going to start shutting down. And this was in 2003. At the time he was diagnosed and wondering what he's going to do you know, in this condition, it emerged this letter that Diana had written to her butler that had been sat on for six years. Her butler's name is Paul Burrell, where she says in this letter, my husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury. And not only had it been, it wasn't the butler who sat on it, it was the London police sat on this letter for six years and did not give it to the French investigators of the accident, mm -hmm. right? And later on when they had an inquest, no one in the royal family was required to testify at that inquest, even though her letter named her husband, he should have been, Prince Charles should have been the top suspect called to testify based on this letter. And it was one of two letters she'd written. So when John saw this, he was, his curiosity was piqued. And he then conducted, I kid you not, it's the most extraordinary detailed forensic investigation of this case and probably of any case ever done. I used to joke to him, John, when you finish with the Diana case, can you go back and start with JFK and work your way forward? <laughs> Now, we'll put a graphic on the screen. He reproduced 10 books, and you'll see some of them there, all about this inquest. Um, and it was really, really thorough. By the fifth book about the inquest, part five, he concluded, he had no preconceptions, he did not go into this with any agenda against the monarchy. He concluded by part five that only the Queen could have ordered her death and that it was carried out by MI6. I want to give you an example of his work quickly. When Diana and Dodie flew into Paris on that day, their security team was harassed, said they were harassed by the paparazzi from the airport all the way to the Ritz. But the paparazzi said, well, no, we didn't. And I, I just want to play a quick, quick clip of this just to situate it for people.
that she had a sister who had a city on the way back to London. But it's how in fact that she had already picked up French colleagues and six photographers who had been to Kingston. Gamma, one of the world's top picture agencies, had sent along one wild ride, one of their photographers. So that's what the day, the, the, the security team's clear, they've got no reason to lie, they were harassed. John points out from all the work he's done, no photos of those paparazzi harassing that car from the airport of the Ritz have ever been published, mm. ever. So later on when they have the inquest, the judge orders the jury do not find murder. So the jury found the next best thing because they couldn't disobey the judge. They found unlawful killing which means that effectively murder, except you don't name those responsible, like, as in individual their names. The, the jury said it was the following vehicles. The media have always reported that as the, oh, that's the paparazzi. No, if you were there at the inquest, you know they weren't talking about the paparazzi. They were talking about these same high-powered motorbikes. They left the paparazzi behind when they were chasing the Mercedes into the tunnel, mm -hmm. right? They were talking about them. So um, this is a big cover-up. It always has been a big cover-up, but... Read this, call in and get a copy. You'll see why this is such a big story because if Di the truth about Diana can come out, it can bring down the monarchy and it can bring down the institutions attached to it like the arms trade, etc. So we've run out of time. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Robbie. Tune in next week for more. The Citizens Electoral Council will be present at the Royal Adelaide Show from the 1st to the 10th of September. Come and see us at the Jubilee Pavilion, site G54.